All right, guys, let's talk a little church planting. If we haven't met, uh, I'm Tony. If we have met, I'm still Tony. And uh, really great to uh, spend some time with you. Appreciate you guys spreading out, making me feel like I'm speaking to a full crowd, uh, having to turn my head uh, all around here. This is a great room to preach in, by the way. I'm very envious of this building. My building is nothing like this. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that we are even talking about church planting is evidence of God's grace. Uh, you know, sometimes when I meet people on a plane or uh, out and about, they, you know, you get in a conversation. I'm sure this has happened to some of you. And they say, uh, so what do you do for a living? And immediately we're forced into a corner, aren't we? Um, if we just come right out with it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create some interesting uh, feedback. So I've started just saying, hey, why don't you guess what I do for a living? <laughs> And uh, usually I don't have a coat on, my shirt's not tucked in, and uh, I've gotten everything. Like, uh, you own a tattoo parlor, you own a Harley shop. Uh, a guy last week said I was a shift worker. Um, I've received everything. And then I get to say I'm a pastor. Uh, and uh, the look on their face is always just, just fantastic. Um, and I usually respond with, I'm more surprised than you are, believe me. Um, I'm, I'm here because of God's grace, and uh, you're here today because of God's grace. And Jesus' specialty is, is changing lives and taking people whose lives were a mess and turning them into messengers of life. And um, I've seen this with church planters through the years. And as we start thinking about church planting, uh, this is quite obvious, but a church planter needs to be a Christian. Um, <laughs> that they need to experience the saving power of the gospel. And often the Lord reaches down into the bottom of the pit and brings up guys um, who are living lives of complete rebellion and turns them into messengers of life. Uh, it's certainly true of the Apostle Paul, and it's true of a couple of friends that, that I think about every time I think about church planting. Uh, for about 15 years in a row, I had the privilege of, of traveling to Kiev Theological Seminary uh, to, to, uh, to teach uh, church planters. I would teach a week at a time. And uh, one time I took a church planter with me who was a, uh, a resident at our church who's now planted a church uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and I was showing him a picture on the wall of these uh, church planters that have passed through the seminary uh, who came from all across the former Soviet Union. And I said to him, you know, uh, Ben, half of these guys are former drug dealers. And I thought he would be amused by that because he himself had a, a story of being a drug dealer before the Lord saved him. In fact, he was uh, living in Buffalo and uh, had three guys come in on his three roommates with guns, uh, take their product, take their money, scared them to death, and they did the only thing that they knew to do at the time, which was go to Blockbuster Video and rent all the Left Behind movies. Um, and that was how they started their spiritual journey, which, which I don't recommend. But um, they, 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 they then had a lot of questions, which is not surprising. And uh, went to a church and uh, by God's grace heard the gospel and then became a Christian, as did his two buddies. They then turned the, uh, the drug house into a Bible study house. And about 80 guys began to, to come to this Bible study when Ben decided, you know, I need to go to seminary and learn what I'm going to say uh, when, it, when it comes to teaching the Bible. And that's how we met, freshly out of that encounter. So I took him over to Ukraine, and I told him about a guy named Emmanuel who was from Lithuania, who was a large man who was about six foot six, who spent time in prison, and um, he had, you know, all these prison tattoos and everything, rough-looking guy. And he said that the only time he had ever opened the Bible before his conversion was to just take pages out of the Bible, fill it full of marijuana, and smoke it. And now he's preaching it. And I, how do you go from smoking the Bible to preaching the Bible? Uh, that, that's a remarkable testimony, isn't it? Uh, Jesus Christ changes lives. And uh, he takes us out of the pit and puts us often in places of leadership and ministry. And uh, we just praise God. So from whatever background you have, uh, before Jesus saved you, uh, we're grateful today that we get to talk about church planting. Um, just the simple fact that we have the privilege of doing this and even thinking about this is evidence of God's grace in our lives. So three basic questions I'd like to raise uh, for you. Uh, why plant a church? Secondly, uh, what are some key traits of a church planter? Uh, and thirdly, what are some practical matters uh, that an uh, aspiring pastor should consider? And Matt, how, how long should I go on here? 40, 30, 40? Okay, just stop me. You got 40 minutes. 40, okay, good. I got the clock going. First time in, in three talks, I actually have the clock going. So, okay, so if you didn't get that, we're basically looking at the why, the who, and the how. Okay, why plant churches? Uh, who should plant a church? 
and how should we plant churches. Some of this is, is biblical, some of it is just basic observation. Uh, the how has a lot of subjectivity to it, so the, the, these, the, when I get there, those are certainly, not all of them at least, you know, laws and principles, biblical principles, but, but, but best practices in some cases. So it's a blend of uh, theological reflection, biblical reflection, personal experience, all right? So uh, why plant a church? Uh, five foundations. First of all, God's purpose has always been to have a people for himself. God never intended just to save individuals and have us to just live the Christian experience in an individualized, isolated way. Uh, we don't just go to heaven. We do go to heaven by ourselves, so to speak, when we die, but we, but we are joined in people, a redeemed people, when we come to faith in Christ. After all, we're made in the image of God, and our God is intensely relational. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there's no surprise that uh, throughout uh, uh, history and throughout uh, you know, even the history of uh, television, some of the most popular shows have been shows related to community. In the 80s, it was Cheers, as guys would get around the bar and know each other's name. Or in the 90s, it was Friends, about six friends and their community. And even We have a show today that's literally called Community. People are craving community, they're craving it, and the Lord has given us the solution to that craving, and it's in the church. God's purpose has always had to, to, be, to have a people for himself. We see that, don't we, with, uh, with, with Adam. It's not good for man to be alone. And with uh, the promise to Abraham, and how God chose to bless the world through Israel. And in the New Testament, we find a number of important passages where the biblical writers remind us that conversion is, is personal, but it's also corporate. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Titus 2, verse 14, where Paul says, Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And you're familiar with 1 Peter, where Peter says, once we were not a people, but now we are a people. God's purpose has always been to have a people for himself, a people that he reveals his glory to, and displays his glory through. And uh, it was already quoted this morning from Acts 18, when Paul was discouraged in Corinth, did you hear what Jesus did for Paul in that promise? He says, I have many people in this city who are my people. Now, church planting simply fits into this grand narrative of what God is doing in the world. So when we plant a church, we're not just starting a little thing in a storefront, or in a house, or in a school, we're taking, place, t taking part in God's redeeming plan that he has uh, established in this world. Therefore, it's a great privilege. It's, that's the wonder of church planting, that we get to participate in what God is doing in having a people for himself, a people that he displays his glory to and through. Okay, second uh, foundation, why plant churches, is the Great Commission. The Great Commission, obviously, uh, doesn't tell us explicitly to plant churches. It does tell us explicitly to, to make disciples. And we're taught in those participles that orbit around that imperative how we are to make disciples, going, and baptizing, and teaching. And we believe that the context for which we do this baptizing and teaching is in the context of the church. Peter preaches at Pentecost, 3,000 are converted, and then we see Baptism, and we see discipleship teaching happening in the church. So the Great Commission is, is pointing us to church planting. We are planting the gospel in view of establishing churches. Okay, foundation number three. The New Testament is largely a collection of church plants. Now, one of the reasons we don't see a lot of verses that are telling us to plant churches is that every letter we read is a church plant. <laughs> with a few exceptions, you know, of, of, uh, found in the New Testament. You just kind of go book by book, and you can trace back the origin to that church. So you've got Corinth. We've already alluded to that in Acts 18. Uh, Paul did not start the church in Rome. Uh, likely that, that church was started by the, the visitors that came on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But we found those house churches mentioned in, in Romans 16. Galatians, those churches were probably formed in... Uh, in light of the relationships we see in Acts 13 and 14, we do know about the origin of the church in Ephesus, don't we? It's one of my favorite stories, is Paul is there in Ephesus, in Acts 19, uh, verse 10, I think it is, where he rents the hall of Tyrannus, 
and is teaching during the siesta period a couple of hours a day, and you just step back and look at that and wonder, what, what good can that do? A city filled with idolatry. Here's this converted Jewish guy going on for a couple of hours, and you see that it did a lot of good. <laughs> that people start burning their magic books. They're coming to faith in Christ. There's almost a riot in the theater. They have to whisk Paul away. And then in the very next chapter in Acts 20, Paul is giving a charge to the elders in Ephesus uh, from Miletus who, who came to visit him. And we see just what happened. They, Paul planted the gospel as he preached in Tyrannus, and as a result, a church was established. Okay? Then we see the church in Philippi started also in, uh, in the book of Acts, Acts 16. Very significant uh, story of a church plant, as this is the first church on European soil. Paul gets there by way of a Macedonian vision, and then we see uh, the new converts, which are very diverse. This is a rich story of a church plant. You have, for example, three different classes of people. The first one is Lydia. She's mentioned. She's there with some ladies, kind of having an old-school Beth Moore Bible study. Um, and uh, the Lord opened her heart as Paul was teaching to pay attention to the gospel, and she's converted. She's a wealthy lady. Uh, she's an Asian. She was religious, not yet converted until Paul came. Um, and then you have this slave girl who was poor, a native Greek, in spiritual turmoil, and Paul displays power and mercy, and uh, she is, is part of this number. And then the chapter ends with this Philippian jailer who's a Roman, who was apparently indifferent, more of a blue-collar guy, and uh, the Lord shakes the earth as Paul and Silas are singing, and he comes out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Others are gathered up, and then we read about Paul writing to uh, the Philippians, and he loved that church. He called that church his joy and his crown. So when we read the book of Philippians, we're reading about a church plant. When we read the book of Ephesians, even though that was probably a circular letter, we're, we're reading about a church plant. Colossians, we don't read about the origin of that because it seems to be a, a started by Epaphras, who was likely present at the hall of Tyrannus. Colossae is not very far from, from Ephesus. And then goes and starts this church. Paul commends him in Colossians 1 and Colossians 4. And he also seems to have taken part in the church plant in Hierapolis, uh, those three places in the Lycus Valley, uh, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And so when we read Colossians, we're reading about a new church plant. And the same with, with the, the church in Thessalonica, which we find the origin of that in, in the book of Acts as well. And so when we're taking part in church planting, we are taking part in really the air of the New Tes Testament. The air that we breathe in the New Testament in many ways is, is new churches. Of the gospel going into places, people coming to faith, and churches being established. Okay? Uh, fourth foundation, Paul's basic ministry methodology was urban church planting. This doesn't mean that Paul didn't have a concern for the outlying areas or rural areas. We want to see churches planted in every nook and cranny of the world. But I think it was a strategy of Paul because he felt like the outlying areas would be reached if the urban areas were reached. And so Paul would, would go preach, as he says in Romans 15, where Christ had not been named. And then he would establish elders. And then he would say things like Romans 15, 23, I no longer have any room for work in this region. Not because everyone had become a Christian, but because the church had been established in a strategic place, elders were raised up, and the church was off and running, and he believed there would be multiplying impact from that strategic church plant. Okay? Uh, fifthly, calling and commendation. Why plant churches? Calling, that is, calling on the part of the church planter, and commendation, that is, or confirmation from other leaders, elders, wise uh, Christians, etc., in other words, Christian uh, church planters have both a personal aspiration to plant a church, and they have external confirmation. So there is first a desire to plant a church. This willingness to uh, make sacrifices, a, a burden if you like, whatever you're comfortable calling this, a conviction, calling, desire. It's the kind of thing you see in uh, Romans 15 where Paul says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. There's a holy ambition that consumes Paul. 
And this happened to me in a strange sort of way when I was in seminary. I don't think many people say this when they go to seminary, but I remember distinctly saying, I don't know what I want to do, but I don't want to be a pastor. And uh, I wanted to preach. I wanted to do evangelism. I wanted to do different things. And um, I took a class called church administration, which sounds like the most boring class. And I don't even like administration. Like when Microsoft Excel gets opened up, I just take a nap. It's just, you know. But we started talking about all things church. And I, I, I hadn't been a Christian very long, about three or four years. And I began to, to think about what would it look like to start a church from the ground up. And uh, I had some professors that pulled me aside and said, hey, you should think about planting a church. And um, I said, well, I've been thinking about that. And it took a long time to, for that to kind of develop as I had a whole lot to learn. Uh, and the Lord took me on several different experiences before that happened. But I remember distinctly this particular zeal, this interest, that kind of, that Romans 15, I would love to build on no one else's foundation. And then there is this aspect of confirmation, where others are seeing in a church planter maturity, desire, abilities, fruitfulness, right? Right? Now, a lot of guys wrestle with, should we plant a church or should we go into an established church or try to do church revitalization? All of them are important, and I'm in no way wanting to elevate one over the other. In some ways, revitalization is harder than planting a church. As has been said before, it's it's harder to raise the dead than give birth. Um, And some of you are in those contexts, and you're like, I'd love to leave and plant a church. Um, So welcome to the session. Um... One of the things we tell our guys is this, which set of problems would you like to deal with? <laughs> church planting problems or uh, established church problems? Now, I personally like church planting problems, um, which is we don't have any people, we don't have any money, we don't have a building. Basically, we don't have squat. Um, and, but we've got a dream. Um, and, and we're going to be, you know, we're, we're, it's going to be difficult in, in the front. But you've got other set of problems in established churches, like uh, very, some, in many cases, not all cases, very strong traditions. Uh, trying to make changes is, is like moving a big ship. Um, you, you know the challenges that I'm talking about. Some of my friends like that, though. They're like, hey, they got a building, they could pay me a salary. Why do I want to plant a church? I want to do that. I'm like, well, good, go to the other session. Uh, but, but I think there's, that's a good assessment question, I think, for a guy who's wrestling with that, just knowing that you're certainly not escaping problems when you plant a church. <laughs> um, but it is a unique kind of, of problem, uh, oftentimes, that you're dealing with. So those are some aspirations. Some of the th- reasons we don't plant a church is because we think it's cool. I, I hope nobody would go into church planting because they think it's sort of the hip thing to do. It wasn't hip when I was a student, and and many of you are much older than me, um, which is not, uh, I'm not not saying anything about your age or anything, but um, you used to be the only guys who planted churches are guys who couldn't find a church. Nobody would hire them, and so they would, they would, uh, that was like the last resort was, I guess I'll plant a church. Um, But now we've got a lot of networks, we've got a lot of interest in church planting. Um, You don't plant a church because you, you like a certain church planter. You know, often uh, these guys are elevated to certain status and, and they get this kind of celebrity status. Um, nor do you plant a church because no one else will let you preach. Or because no one will call you to pastor an existing church. Or because you're frustrated with your church. Uh, that's, that, that can be really problematic. Or that you're out to, to prove something. So these are some real heart questions, I think, that we need to work into uh, our, you know, our, our thinking. All right, so those are some reasons why, just basic five foundations. Now, what are some key traits uh, of a church planter? Uh, the church planting organization that I work with, we use 11 particular competencies, and if you want the, the full treatment of this, I have a book in the bookstore called The Faithful Church Planter. Uh, feel free to grab it, it and it covers these 11, these 11 competencies. Um, and there's a good bit of overlap within these, these traits uh, of a church planter. Uh, others create a, a, a additional um, characteristics. Tim Keller's book, Church Planter Manual, has 18 characteristics. So I, I'm going easy on you uh, with, with just 11. Um, let me just rattle them off, and I'll just make a few comments about, about a few of them, not all of them, okay? Because they pretty much speak for themselves. First of all is spiritual vitality. Spiritual vitality. Secondly, 
theological clarity. Let's just talk about those two for a second. Spiritual vitality is obviously important. This is the, the church planter's prayer life, a vibrant devotional life. Some of these things are just basic to Christianity, right? Just basic Christian leadership stuff. It's not unique to church planters. But when it comes to church planting, there is a sense in which you are very, very desperate. I remember Keller in that church planter manual talking about when he went from Westminster as a professor to trying to plant a church in Manhattan that his prayer life broke open like never before. And I, I think you experience something like that. Uh, the prayer of a church planter is the prayer of Jehoshaphat. We are powerless and we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's a great prayer, isn't it? I wish that prayer was as popular as the prayer of Jabez. We need a prayer of Jehoshaphat book. Um, we are powerless and we do not know what to do, 2 Chronicles 20, but our eyes are on you. In other words, a church planter is a beggar, begging for God to do something. We don't rest in our power, we don't rest in our intellect, or our gifting. I tell guys, when you, when you think a church planter, don't think rock star, think farmer. There's nothing glorious about a farmer. They get up early, they work hard, they plant seeds, and then they beg God for it to rain. And if it does rain, and they see fruit, well, they ought to give glory to God, because He's the one who sent the rain. They don't go around bragging about their fruit, and no, neither should a church planter. And so, spiritual vitality, is, is there a real sense of Psalm 127? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Theological clarity. This is uh, significant, obviously, because God is building His church by His Word. And church planters need to know His Word. There's a difference in building a crowd and building a church. You can build a crowd on gimmicks, you can build a crowd on personality, but you can't build a church. You build a church on God's Word. And the, the aim of a church planter is to saturate their church, their city, with sound doctrine. And that's why we need churches, even in places where there are some churches, because you all know that not every church is preaching the gospel that calls itself a church. We need to saturate the whole world with sound doctrine. And often church planters are known for being hip, or for being able to kind of connect with people, but not being theologically robust. And we need theologically sharp church planters. For parts of uh, the world in the West, you know, we're up against this secularism and the things that has already been mentioned in this uh, conference. But in other parts of the world, like my friends in Africa, they say the problem is not that, you know, trying to get people to consider spiritual things. It's that they, they, they need theological clarity because they're prone to synchronism, syncretism, and, and the blending of Christianity with other cults and religions and so on. And so the church planter needs to know his context and needs to be precise in his doctrine. Church planter needs to know the gospel thoroughly and needs to know what a church is. Like it's surprising how many guys go out to plant a church and they've never thought through ecclesiology. Like if you're going to start something, know what it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> like think through your polity, think through uh, all of these things about what makes a church a church, okay? Uh, uh, the third trait that we highlight, I've already mentioned in the previous section, is conviction and commendation, that there is a desire and there's confirmation. Uh, the fourth is a healthy marriage. That is for those who are married. We don't think that every church planter has to be married. After all, the Apostle Paul seemed to do pretty well as a single guy. Um, but those, for those who are, uh, that is, that's very critical that um, the, the spouse is on board and that you're cultivating a really joyful marriage. Um, I've seen through the years, tragically, as I'm sure you guys have, guys who have been disqualified from ministry um, because, they, uh, because of infidelity, and it often started with just not cultivating a rich, healthy marriage. And it's easy sometimes, I think, to envision personal holiness as being kind of like your quiet time only, and not putting your marriage in the center of your understanding of personal holiness. Um, just the way the pastoral epistles do when we get the qualifications for the pastor, like that statement about marriage is right in the middle of it. And so, so that's all part of our, our godliness, is cultivating a, a healthy marriage. 
Uh, fifthly, a healthy, rela- healthy relationships. That is that the church planter is good with people, or he loves people. Uh, we have a church planter that is, is a good preacher. He, he's not uh, the guy that's going to be at conferences, but he is really good at what I call the ground game. He is just with people all week long, and he is doing remarkably well. And often what we see is we have guys who have good theological clarity, but nobody wants to hang out with them. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to be with them. And if you can't gather people, well, that's going to be a problem. Um, it's possible to be theologically robust and have a warm disposition. In fact, I would argue that Charles Spurgeon has left us with a great legacy of that. You know, Spurgeon has this, this quote or this uh, excerpt in lectures to my students that I haven't framed yet, but I, I want to at some point. This is what he says. I love a minister whose face invites me to make him my friend, on whose doorstep you read, welcome, not beware of dog. <laughs> Give me the man, I love this, around whom the children come. An individual who doesn't have a friendly, cheerful manner about him had better be an undertaker and bury the dead, for he will never succeed in influencing the living. A man, I love this, a man must have a great heart if he is to have a great congregation. When a man has a large, loving heart, men go to him as ships to a haven. Such a man is hardy in private as well as in public. That's what we mean by healthy relationships. There's a big heart. After all, hospitality is a qualification for a pastor, right? I've often heard in established churches that pastors go in view of a call. It would be great if they also went in view of hospitality. Let's watch how you you, uh, interact with individuals. All right, number six is is godly leadership. That is, uh, there's there's holiness, there's happiness in ministry, there's, there's humility. We read of scandal after scandal of domineering leadership. That's just destroying the reputation of the church. Number seven is spiritual maturity. A lot to say here. Sometimes God matures us indirectly through trials that he sends our way. But we also need to pursue spiritual maturity. This is very important when you think about young church planters, right? Because oftentimes people's gifts surpass their maturity. And that's a dangerous place. And so we, we want maturity to actually outpace gifting. And maturity is the one thing you can, quote, kind of control. Like the Lord blesses people with gifts in different ways. But the one thing we can all be pursuing is, is holiness, is godliness. All right, number eight is a missional lifestyle. So this church planter is, is already doing the work of evangelism. He's already, uh, you know, practicing hospitality and hanging out with people who aren't Christians and can be winsome with the gospel, those kinds of things. Uh, Number nine is faithful in disciple making, faithful disciple making. So we're looking for those who are already doing the work of teaching, already doing the work of disciple making. Like to never do disciple making and then want to plant a church, there's something wrong, right? But this should just be the normal part of our our life, uh, this this work of, of disciple making. We often tell our guys, you know, don't, don't view the pulpit as the only place for, to, for teaching the Bible. Um, you know, I, I liken the ways we teach to like uh, golf. Uh, you have three types of golf clubs, essentially. You've got the woods, and you've got the, the irons, and you've got the putter. And I liken preaching to the woods. You know, it's big, it's showy, it covers a lot of ground. And so that's kind of like preaching. And then you've got the irons, which is a little bit more finesse, more like a dialogue. It's like classroom, small group. And then you got that really strange club in your bag called the putter. <laughs> and I liken that to kind of one-on-one or two or three guys with you. You're discipling in all of those areas, from the pulpit, in a classroom, across a table, having a coffee. But a lot of guys only have a driver in their bag. And you go out to the golf course and you look at guys as they, they're getting warmed up. The guys who aren't any good at golf like me are usually just swinging the driver. And, and all of the guys who are good are over there practicing the putting game. <laughs> as they often say, you drive for show and you putt for dough. 
Uh, that's, where, that's where the magic is with, with that putter. And a lot of guys only have a driving game when it comes to teaching the Bible. And they sort of view a church as like their preaching dome. Uh, it, 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 that's, that's, but we need to be very diverse in, our, in, the, in, the, in the areas in which we teach the Bible, always making disciples, right? Uh, ten, and with that, is the ability to teach. This is uh, one of the, the, the skills in the pastoral epistles that a, a pastor, and consequently a church planter, should have the ability uh, to teach. And then finally, uh, the, the other, the, the last trait that we highlight is an entrepreneurial aptitude. Entrepreneurial aptitude. That is, you have the skill to develop new works. You guys know what an entrepreneur is. This is the one competency that you don't really have a Bible verse for, like you have, you need to be able to teach, you have a verse for that. But I think you can pull some threads together and make sort of a biblical case for needing this to be a church planter. And I think all of these traits should be present in a pastor in general, but I think this particular thing is unique to church planting in some ways. And of course some pastors have this as well, but I think church planters are usually self-starters, they're catalytic, they cast vision, they gather people, they're good stewards of everything God's given them. They're innovative, they see opportunities. It's kind of like the parable of the talents. They're using everything that God has entrusted them with to multiply it. Um, this is like Ecclesiastes when the writer says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or to eight for you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. That's, that's an uh, illustration from, from shipping. Cast your, send seven or eight ships out, not just one. If, if a disaster happens and you only send out one, then you may not get any return, but diversify your investments. Use everything that God has given you. And I think the church planter uh, usually has those kinds of traits. Creative in mission, um, using various avenues to connect with people in the city, not bound to uh, just rote presentations that, that other churches uh, perhaps have taught them, that kind of thing. It's kind of Martin Luther using the printing press, using art, using all of those things in order to uh, see a reformation get started. So those are the, the, the kinds of things we're talking about. Now, the last section here, uh, how to plant a church, just some practical considerations in nine minutes. That was about right, nine minutes? Yeah. Okay, should I do nine marks? Okay, nine minutes. Uh, I, I have 11, 11 matters. That's my new thing, 11 matters of a church plant. I'll never get through them all, but number one, uh, take the preparation time seriously. If you're in the pipeline, don't wait to start doing some stuff, okay? First of all, like you should be with a, a seasoned pastor and be in some kind of residency program or something where, where you're being trained. But here's the things I would encourage you to prepare for if you're about to plant a church or you're aspiring to. One of them is criticism. What, we see this a lot with young guys. If, um, if you're going out as a younger guy and you've always been successful and people have always liked you, just know both of those probably aren't gonna happen. Um, <laughs> but prepare, this, this, when I pastored my first church, I could not believe that people didn't like me. They just didn't like me, man. Like uh, I wanted to, I was ready to argue for the resurrection the inspiration of the Bible, and so on, and nobody wanted to argue about those things. They were upset because we didn't have toilet paper in the women's bathroom. The, uh, right, the, 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 uh, the homecoming wasn't in the bulletin, and, I w and, and so a lot of people, I, I had, and I had never been taught how to handle criticism. Um, and so I think do everything you can, not to be criticized right now, but do everything you can to, to learn and glean and really set your expectations properly. Uh, because idealism gets knocked off you pretty quickly. Um, so that's one thing I'd prepare for. The other thing I'd tell you to prepare for is, it, uh, is to go ahead and prepare sermons. Not 100% of each, each week, but we tell our guys, why don't you consider a book like Philippians and prepare a 12-week series and leave, 70 to eight, uh, leave uh, 20 to 30% of it unprepared each week where you can add your application once you get on the field, once you know your people well, but the reason we tell them to do some legwork ahead of time is because once you get in the world of church planting, you're going to be overwhelmed by all the things you've got to do. And you, it can be Friday and you haven't looked at your, your sermon at all. So maybe get a jump on that. Um, 
work out your theology of suffering because that's one thing that uh, you really learn by experience, how to minister to suffering people. And you will, you're going to be doing that really from the jump, even though you might have a bunch of young people in a church plant. Uh, think through how you're going to minister to suffering people. What are you going to say to them? What are your key texts? Um, I would tell you to prepare for conflict, even on your church planting team. Um, begin to work through some of those principles on how to, how to deal with conflict. Um, and then finally, I would encourage you to prepare for controversial questions. What, what I mean by that is we, we have in our intern group about, um, I don't know, seven or eight what I call back pocket papers that we tell our guys to write. They're short, just two to three pages. But it's your response to these issues. Know what you're going to say about issues of gender, marriage, um, women in ministry, uh, the use of alcohol, marijuana, spiritual gifts. Get them all, man. <laughs> Take all the hot ones. Then you're going gonna, you're gonna to be dealing with them immediately. And don't wait till you start pastoring and then you start running to the books thinking about what you're going to say. So th those are just some tips that I would give. Okay. Um, so take the preparation time seriously. Secondly, this should go without saying, but resolve in your heart to be Christ-centered in all things. And this is just my plea to, to avoid pragmatism. That is, avoid just doing what you think is going to work. Because you can do a lot of things that may, quote, work, that may not be honoring to Christ. It may not truly be building up the church. We need to remember that sometimes success to Jesus looks like failure to other people. Be Christ-centered in all things. Next, remember that church planting is a team sport. So think through your, your team. Think through theological unity, philosophical unity. Spend time together. Um, we tell our guys that team is more important than location. We can plant churches in all sorts of places, and I think a lot of places will get old over time. But who you're with all the time really matters. So church planting is a team sport. And that's the one, benef one of the benefits of church planting is you get to pick your team. Once you get started, you don't get to pick who shows up on a Sunday. <laughs> right? And sometimes you're surprised at who shows up. You're like, why are you here? Um, so work. I, we, we encourage our guys to spend uh, considerable time with that core team first before they begin the work of, of launching a new church. Next, plant the church that fits you and your community. That is, don't just try to copy someone else's model, but think through contextually where you're at and think through your own context. I was teaching a group of Kenyans a couple years ago, actually it's about four years ago now, and I said, when you do music, prepare music for Kenyans. Don't just copy and paste American stuff. Because you, you go to parts of the world and you're like, why are you guys doing that stuff that we do over here? Like, think through rich lyrics, yes, but, but, but plan a church that fits your community. And plan a church that fits you, that is, that, that you can lead intuitively. And, and don't just copy and paste uh, what you've seen some successful person do. Do some good self-assessment and do assessment of your community. Um, next, as you be begin to see people come, set clear expectations for potential members. It's very important because a lot of people are going to come into a church plant because they're just upset with their current church. And you don't want disgruntled people coming in because they won't be happy at your church, most likely. And so make sure you have a good membership process. It's a shame that it, 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 there's more expected usually to be a frat member than a church member or a gym member than a church member. And so have your membership class or whatever, interview potential members, do the, the kinds of things that need to be done to, to create clear expectations for those who are coming. And it's really important in a church plant because you may also get a lot of young people who don't have any sort of ecclesiology. And they, they really need to be discipled in ecclesiology. And so that's, that's going to be really important. 
All right, a few more, and we'll take some questions. Once your church is established, I would encourage you as a church planting preacher to do two things. In addition to teaching the Bible and exalting Christ, lead the church from the pulpit and speak to outsiders regularly, that is, unbelievers. By leading the church, what I, what I mean is drip the vision of the church week by week. Because you, the, the pulpit is the front door to a church plant. That's, people are hearing what you're about uh, as they're watching you preach. They're, they're more impacted by that than the website. And so we practice, as I say, this drip method of preaching where we're constantly telling people what we're about. And then speak to outsiders. I like to address outsiders in the introduction, somewhere along the way in the body, and then at the end. And that's very important in a church plant because you are planting a church to reach unbelievers in large measure. We're not just there to, to get other people's uh, sheep. We're not sheep swapping when we're planting churches. And one of the things that's happening when you're preaching to unbelievers week by week is you begin to create an evangelistic culture in your church. And the people sitting there in your church who are Christians are thinking to themselves, I need to be bringing my unbelieving friends. And this doesn't mean 90% of our sermon is directed to unbelievers, but I think about 10% should be. Where they at least feel included in the sermon. And that's why I like to address them in the beginning. Try to get everybody on the bus. And then along the way, address objections that you know some unbelievers have. So that people begin to bring their, their non-Christian friends uh, to, to corporate worship. All right. Um, next, don't give leadership away too quickly. This is a real temptation in church planting. I heard a friend one time say, man, if people love Jesus and they don't smoke weed, they're an elder in my church. Uh, it's a low bar. Uh, he, was, he was exaggerating, of course, but th there is that temptation. Uh, you, as you grow, you're like, where are the leaders at? We've got a bunch of new believers or a bunch of young people, and I would just rather have a small group that's too big that has a good leader rather than multiplying too quickly or whatever and putting the wrong person in place. Because you get the wrong person in place and say a small group, it can create dr great drama. And so be really careful about turning people loose uh, with, with leadership. Uh, number 10, teach and reteach your people to be missionaries. Teach and reteach your people to be missionaries. We've gone about this a number of ways, but I'll just mention one way that we've continued to emphasize that our people are the missionaries of our church is the use of, of hospitality that lives can be, be changed by you just going to your neighbor and say, hey, you want to come over for a barbecue on Thursday? Open up your life, open up your home, eat with people regularly, and live with a gospel intentionality. And then finally, plan to rest and retreat. Trials will exhaust you. Growth can exhaust you. Departures, people leaving. Your own failures will exhaust you. Tough conversations will exhaust you. So take a day off. Take some, some retreats with your team. Think about when you plant a church, I'm preparing for a 30-year run. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Don't think three years, think 30. So if you're going to do that, make sure you're going at a pace you can sustain. And this is a real challenge for really driven people who want to plant churches. I know that firsthand, to make sure we're going at a pace uh, that, we can, that we can take. All right, it's a lot of material, guys, I understand, but I know this is sort of a reformed crowd, and you read the Puritans, so you, surely you can handle uh, all of those points, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a new Puritan paperback in the making right there. Uh, Tony Marita, the tattooed Puritan on uh, church planting. Okay, um, we want to do questions? Q&A for till 45, so you got 12, All right, yeah. A few minutes for uh, Q&A. We've got uh, my brother with a mic. You can hit anything church planting, things I said or things I didn't say. So you um, talked a lot about what a church planter would look like. My question is, a lot of the church planting that we see in the New Testament, they're done by apostles. So um, what would you say are some very specific things you can point to that would qualify someone to be a church planter? Do they have to have like a role in the church or do they just simply need a list of qualifications? 
Uh, well, I mean, I would start with uh, the pastoral qualifications, and I would start by, you know, again, uh, being, being affirmed by those in the local church, um, yeah, to, to set out to, uh, to plant a church. I would not encourage a guy to go out Lone Ranger without a church sending him to plant a church. I mean, even though Paul is an apostle, you're right, that he's also tied to the church throughout uh, right, the book of Acts. He's sent out, he comes back, gives reports, and so on. So it, it really should be a, a church that's sending. That church plant, uh, networks don't plant churches, churches plant churches. And I, and I think uh, they, they should be brought up from within the body and, and then sent out. So a lot of, I would have a lot of engagement with your elders and with wise leaders in your church. Yeah, question. Distance, um, as far as establishing a church, how do you see that? I'm not sure if you had mentioned that during your talk for how close do you look to plan a church to the next and so on. Okay, I missed that last part. How close do you plan to, do you plant a church to the next? So oh, if okay. you plan a church in, let's say, Dallas, mm -hmm. I mean, I live in Dallas now, and it's yeah. a church about every block, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. distance will, will be something that you go off and kind of have done yourself. Uh, and it's a hard one to answer because I think every context is different. You really have to think like a missiologist uh, with, with church planting in that you're doing assessment on different cities for that, like in your case, um, are there particular people groups in, in certain pockets of Dallas that don't have a gospel preaching church? I would say even though there's a church, as you say, on every corner, there may still be a need for a church in that context. Um, and so um, I'd, I wouldn't make it necessarily about distance, but um, we, we, sometimes we refer to them as gospel priority areas. Like what areas really need the gospel in our area? It, um, for us, it's like I'm in Raleigh, but we think there's a great need in Chapel Hill. Um, there's a great need in parts of Durham, uh, uh, the south part of Raleigh and the east part of Raleigh, which we're sending church plants to. So we're trying to plant all around the triangle. Uh, so even though there, there, there are churches, church buildings are there, but often, you know, gospel is not being preached in certain places where they have churches. Um, so I would just look at what, what are the priority areas? Where's the gospel need? And that could be a short distance from your church, or it could be a little bit longer. Yeah. Where are we going? That's a good beard right there, man. Thank you. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. Um, without saying the name of it, I'm a part of a group of churches, and they have a heavy emphasis on church planting, and they have a list. I'm just going to to name two of them. They have a list of distinctives of requirements for church planting, and I would just like to hear your response. If you feel like they're legitimate or however you feel about them, just two of them is one is that the church plant has to be involved in some sort of social justice program, project, or endeavor, and also um, must not meet on Sunday mornings and have a Sunday centric type of church structure. Wow. Yeah. I know. Do you, do you lead that network? No. Okay, good. I was making sure. Yeah. No, I don't like either of those at all. Uh, I mean, I, I, what is a church? I mean, that's a important, important question. Like the Reformers talked about where the Gospels preach, right, where the sacraments are being administered, and with that there's church discipline. And so um, I, I, I think there are many... Uh, there are many implications of the gospel that is going to lead churches to do various things, but I would not put at all social justice within what it, what's essentially a church, and that doesn't fit in that, that model, right? Um, lots of good mercy ministry that we can do, but that is, that is not an essential thing that makes, makes a church a church, right? Um, so, and then I'm a Lord's Day guy, so I would want to be meeting on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are other questions? Um, I just had a lot of great points about kind of the individual competencies, but I was curious if you could expand a little bit on the makeup of like a team for a church plant. I was a part of a church plant in college, and it was just the pastor and his wife who planted, and they burned out very quickly. And so I was curious if you had a little insights about size, identifying people for it, and things like that. Yeah, this is a really short answer, but we look at the, the, the diaconate passage in 1 Timothy 3 as like a place to start. 
So high character people, people willing to serve. And I think if you can get those as close to that sort of individual, you're, you're off in a, in a good place. We kind of use uh, the paradigm of theological unity, philosophical unity, um, competency, and, and harmony. You know, like they, they fit the, co the chemistry of your team, but, but they can also do some stuff that's going to be, they're really going to contribute uh, in whatever their skill is or ability. Um, but they're also with you theologically because you don't want someone on a team that's going to create theological disunity. Uh, you, the core team really needs to be together theologically. And philosophically, I mean, like you're agreeing on how to do church. Um, like you may there, may, there are different ways one could argue how to do a small group. But I think you want your core team to say, we're going to do it this way and we all agree on that. Um, we're not saying that's the only way to do it, but there's an agreement that I'm not going to create disunity in an area that's, that's you know, somewhat subjective uh, and somewhat based on context. So I kind of look, kind of 1 Timothy 3, uh, deacon stuff, what makes a good team, think through that. People have servant hearts, um, people who are, who are mobile, you know, um, people that, you know, you're not taking them because they're disgruntled, um, but uh, really look for maturity. Um, yeah. Uh, everything you say just sounds good for the established church too, which is where I'm at. Talk to me about addressing outsiders. And especially when you know that pretty quick you're going to hit within the course of two or three weeks, two or three Sundays, uh, or people are going to come in knowing that if you've got conservative uh, values that they're, you're going to talk about their home, their bedroom, their whatever. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you do that early on when you, when you know that's coming too. Yeah, very carefully. Yeah, very carefully. Um, you know, um, are, you, are you talking about the weekly pulpit uh, of an established church? You mentioned out, dealing with outsiders. You mentioned yeah. you talking about outsiders in there, and so however you do it or, yeah. or suggest, and, so, and in the pulpit too. But, you, but yeah, when I speak about it, I'm speaking more, I guess, in the evangelistic sense of, of appealing to them. I think they're going to hear more of uh, the implications of the gospel through my exposition as we hit different values, right? Different, different topics. Going through Genesis, we're hitting gender, marriage, and whatever, those kinds of things. But I'm speaking to them more on, uh, hey, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I do this a lot in the introduction. We're really glad you're here. We're studying this. And I usually say, it's a great week for you to be here. And I just make up a reason why. Uh, usually it's like whatever text it is, because it really is a great week for them to be here. So if, if we're going through the book of Acts, I'll say it's a great week for you to be here because we're looking at the church and maybe you, uh, you're turned off by the church because of bad things that have happened in history. And I understand that, but you should at least know what the church ought to be doing. And so this is, we want to invite you in on the study. Whatever the topic is, I just try to hook them really quick so that they're at least engaged. And then along the way in the sermon, just try to address, hey, uh, if you're not a Christian, you may have this objection. And it's usually, I don't try to do anything uh, uh, clever. It's whatever's in the text that I'm working through that I know they won't like. And it'll be a lot of things usually. And so if you're talking about a text that talks about wrath, like you may be really turned off by that. Well, let me explain why this is reasonable to understand this. And then I, I try to appeal to them at the end to, to believe on Christ. Um, so it, that's more of the, the evangelistic uh, exposition that I try to do week in and week out. Yeah. Uh, my question kind of comes to the perspective of wanting to be a healthy sending church. Yeah. We have a, a couple young guys that are very talented. One of them very close to me taking diligent notes. I think he's going to be. So what it does from the financial side of it, what does personal finances of the guy being sent and then what does a healthy sending church, what's yeah. Supporting that guy as he goes out. What's that look like? Yeah, I mean, if you can take care of the salary, that is huge. Um, the two big obstacles, I think, are, are people and, and money. And if you can knock one or two of those out so that, so that they have, a, if they have a, a good enough team that they can have a sustainable group soon, that's wonderful. So we're not just sending out four guys. But if we can send out 15-ish, 15 to 30, who knows? But then if you're able to provide that kind of pastoral salary that you would pay for a staff member, um, or maybe half of that, and he's raising the other part of that, um, that, that would be wonderful. Um, so that they can devote more time and energy to, to the work. We also at our church um, encourage team bivocational church planting. 
as another model, not the exclusive model, but sending out three pastors who have full-time jobs that share responsibilities. And then they don't feel the pressure of trying to make it to a certain number so that they can have their salary paid. But they can sort of take a slow burn approach. You know, does that make sense? Um, I think not a lot of people uh, consider that, not enough people consider that. So you take three guys who are like lay elders that are already doing this, they could really go start a house church in an area and start doing the work of evangelism and just see where the Lord takes it. Um, and I, I think I, that's a very simple model to church planting, but we don't have to overthink it. We can really do it in a simple way. Um, so I don't know, those are, those are some thoughts. I think just directing them towards some good assessment um, in, in someone outside of the church assessing their gifts and, and those kinds of things is also helpful. Yeah. Done? All right, guys, enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Enjoy your break.